democracy and dictatorship. And in fact, over the last two weeks, you've really had an opportunity to see both in action with the presidential election, congressional election south of the border, and the uh, selection of the new leadership in China across the Pacific Ocean. It was fantastic. In two weeks' time, you got to see arguably the two most powerful countries in the world selecting their next generation of leaders in quite fundamentally different ways. So we've talked a lot about what democracies are and what they're not. We've talked about what non-democracies are and what they're not. We've talked about the normative positions that you might share with respect to these types of political order. And today we're going to talk more about international relations. We're going to talk about relationships between countries such as the United States and China, two most powerful countries in the world. But let me begin by just reminding you what we do in political science. Political science, we purport to doing theory. And when we say political science theory, what we mean is that we try to come up with law-like generalizations, assertions that we can make that more or less describe and hence allow us to predict how people, economies, firms, and indeed governments will behave. One of the most prevalent theories in international relations, or IR, is what we call the democratic peace theory. And basically, the democratic peace theory argues or predicts or explains that democracies don't fight one another. It's a very simple assertion that democracies tend not to fight one another. And if you look throughout history, and you look at the empirical track record, this theory actually has a pretty good track record. Generally speaking, democracies do not fight one another. And we have in political science a set of theories as to why this is the case. Oftentimes, democracies are allies. Oftentimes, democracies share ideological affinities i.e. the end of history thesis, democracies tend to adhere to a liberal democratic, liberal capitalist set of ideological ethos. And democracies tend to be slow. It tends to take a long time for democracies to make decisions. And when you have two slow governments trying to decide if they're going to go to war with one another, generally speaking, by the time they get around to it, they've figured out some other way to resolve their conflict. So in many ways, this theory, this law-like generalization that we have generated in political science is a pretty good theory. But I want to suggest to you that actually as a discipline, some might even say as an industry, we're not very good at theory. For instance, we did not predict the end of the Cold War. And I have a lot of classmates and colleagues who were all feverishly writing books in 1988, 1989 about NATO, Cold War, Soviet Union, and just as they were about to get these books and dissertations published, the Cold War half ends, and they had nothing to write about. So we're not generally very good at predicting how things are gonna work out. In fact, I would say that one of the characteristics of politics and international relations more generally is uncertainty. We deal with a world of uncertainty all the time, and we live, indeed all you have to do is scan the newspapers any day, we live in an age of extraordinary uncertainty. So we have two contending forces here. On the one hand, we live in a world of uncertainty, yet on the other hand, as a discipline, we try to predict. We try to say with a fair degree of certainty how states will predict, and we try to explain why and how countries behave the ways in which they do. Now, a good example of this tension and this uncertainty uh, rests in the case of Taiwan. Now, let's think about this. Where is, what is Taiwan? Taiwan is a tiny island off the southeast coast of China. And in the first instance, we know there are lots of missiles pointed at China, I at Taiwan. These missiles are in China, but no one actually knows how many missiles. There's already a fair degree of uncertainty there. 
there are between 1,800 or 1,500 missiles pointed at Taiwan at any given time, depending on who you ask. Taiwan, if you didn't know, is the 14th largest trading economy in the world. Per capita income and power, purchasing power parity ranks it as one of the richest countries or richest areas in Asia. And it's also a democracy. However, it has a very interesting history. You'll recall two weeks ago we talked about the Chinese Civil War, the Chinese Civil War between the Chinese Communist Party on the one hand and Mao Zedong, and the Nationalist Party on the other hand. And they engaged in the Civil War throughout the 1930s and 1940s. We know, of course, the Communists win. The Civil War and the Nationalist Party flees to Taiwan in the 1940s. During the Cold War, of course, the Chinese Communist Party and the People's Republic of China, that is, Big China, was not recognized internationally. You can understand this. In light of the Cold War, it was viewed as part of the Communist world, and therefore then the Allied powers of the West chose not to recognize the People's Republic of China, but instead recognized the nationalist government on Taiwan. And it was called Taiwan, the Republic of China. It was basically a government in exile. But in the eyes of the international community, that government on that little island was the legitimate government of the whole of China. In the 1970s, however, China begins to rise, as we know, and it begins to normalize, what we call normalized relations with the West, and in particular with the United States during the 1970s. And once China normalizes relations with the U.S., the government on Taiwan is no longer legitimate. It loses its seat in the United Nations. It loses the rights of sovereignty. Taiwan is no longer a nation state, but rather, legally speaking, Taiwan is a province of China. And China, therefore, then makes a sovereign claim on Taiwan. However, though Taiwan is technically, or what we say de jure, a province of China, it is in many ways a de facto, that is to say, in fact, or in reality, an independent place, an independent state. It has its own economy, it has its own military, it has its own government, it has its own president, it runs its own foreign policy, but it is not a country. It is not a formally independent state. We also know that in Taiwan there was a democratic transition during the 19, late 1980s and 1990s. And part of this democratization moment in Taiwan was a process by which we saw the formation of a formal independence movement. And so throughout the beginning of the early 1990s, activists within Taiwan say, look, we just democratically elected our own government. We have our own economy, we have our own foreign policy. We should strive for formal independence. And in 1996, on the eve of presidential elections in Taiwan, China launches missiles across the Taiwan Strait, this narrow band of about 100 miles, and these missiles land about 30 miles off the coast of Taiwan, basically scares the shit out of Taiwan. <laughs> To make matters worse for Taiwan, in 2005, the Chinese government passes into law the anti-secession law, which now says in its own laws that should Taiwan declare independence, China will use force. Right? That China will engage military tactics in the event that Taiwan declares independence. In response to this, in 2010, Taiwan engages in an arms procurement bill in which it buys large amounts of military equipment from who? The United States. Because the United States, upon recognizing China in the 1970s, also signed into its own laws the Taiwan Relations Act, which said that the United States would come to the defense of Taiwan if it is attacked. The fact of the matter is, 
We have a very complex situation, but what, of course, undergirds all of this is the fact that there are 800 to 1,500 missiles pointed at Taiwan. And while I go to China often, I go to Taiwan often as well, and I ask my friends there all the time, aren't you nervous? You know, 800 missiles pointed at Taiwan. They only have to travel about 100 miles. There's no way any American defense fleet can get into the Taiwan Strait by the time these missiles completely decimate the island many times over. Aren't you nervous? Some people on Taiwan are nervous. They fully understand that if China were to attack Taiwan, Taiwan would be completely decimated within minutes or hours. Others recognize, however, that Taiwan represents strategic importance to the United States. The U.S. isn't particularly friendly with China. It's an important that the U.S. has a good relationship with Taiwan. Taiwan is oftentimes referred to as the largest natural aircraft carrier for American planes. Therefore, many in Taiwan say, well, it is a little nerve-wracking having all these missiles pointed at us, but we generally have faith that the United States will defend us if we are attacked. We're of strategic importance to the U.S. And on moral grounds, we're a democracy, and if America really does care about democracy, we would expect that the United States will come defend us on moral grounds. Now, I can assure you, I have no intention of living on Taiwan long enough to find out which of these scenarios is going to come to pass. The point here is there's tremendous uncertainty. There are a lot of different scenarios that can play out. We don't know how China will act. We don't know how Taiwan will act. And certainly, we don't know how the United States will act. But one thing we do know for certain is that Taiwan, the people living on Taiwan, was not worried until the 1990s. Taiwan only begins to worry once China becomes a factor, and China only became a factor after it had risen. So there's lots that we don't know about how international relations will proceed. There's lots that we don't know about how China will behave. But there are a few things that we do know. First thing we know is that China is an economic superpower. We can see here, basically, economic development in China is flatlined throughout the early Chinese Communist period and beginning in the late 1970s, when China begins to open up its economy, you can see this massive and steep economic growth trajectory. GDP in 1952 in China was 68 billion RMB, which is their currency. In 2004, it's at 18 trillion. So over the course of about two generations, three generations, China goes from being an economic basket case, now being, of course, the second largest economy in the world, and it's just a matter of time that it will eclipse the United States as the single largest economy in the world. So we know that for sure. And we know that this accelerates in the 1980s and indeed in the 1990s. We also know that China has enormous stocks of hard power. In international relations, when we talk about hard power, we're talking about straight up military power and military capability. As we know, prior to the recent era, China was militarily backward. It had lost the Opium War to the English in the mid-19th century. It lost the Sino-Japanese War at the end of the 19th century, which we discussed last time. It suffered at the hands of the Japanese invasion of the 1930s. Even during the Civil War, basically China's military was dependent upon a peasant army. Lots of people, lots of soldiers, very low technology, and so on. And we also know under the era of Mao, China was technologically uh, backward. Now, China is the second largest military spender in the world. It spends more on its military than Russia. It's the second largest spender in the world, only behind the United States. And of course, China is a nuclear power as well. One of the key characteristics of the People's Liberation Army or the conventional forces, military forces in the United States, or in China, is that 
in terms of active military personnel, the standing army in China is larger than that of the U.S. There are 1.5 soldiers for every one soldier in the U.S. military. In terms of land-based weapons, tanks, land-based artillery, they are now equal. The United States and China. In terms of the Navy, China is behind the United States. In fact, in many ways, one could argue that American military hegemony is based on American military dominance, is based on its naval power. But the Chinese have been outspending the Americans in naval power over the last decade. And now China is about to unveil and put into circulation what we call a blue water navy, or a navy that can extend further beyond its own shores, and specifically aircraft carriers. Defense spending, of course, the United States still spends more than any other country in the world by many times. So Chinese defense spending, even though it's second in the world now in absolute terms, is still one-eighth of that of the United States. But here's the key point. In terms of available military personnel, China's potential uh, size of its military in terms of personnel is five times larger than that of the United States. So even though the Americans are continue to be technologically ahead, in just in terms of sheer number of soldiers, the Chinese are actually not that far behind. So we know that China is a growing military power. Not only in economic power, but also in military power. We also know that China's stock of what we call in political science soft power is also on the rise. Soft power is that ability of a country to influence another country without the use of military. So in many ways, it is still influence, but it's the opposite of hard power. It is the ability to influence the behavior of other countries, though not through the military. So one way, for instance, in which China is gaining enormous amounts of soft power is in terms of investment. China is now one of the largest investors specifically in Africa and the developing world. It is, in essence, gaining, or you might say a bit more cynical, buying influence in much of the developing world by investing capital, investing foreign exchange into these otherwise cash-starved economies. In 2003, Chinese investments in Africa and the less developed world amount to about half a trillion, or half a billion dollars. Four years later, in 2007, Chinese investment in Africa and less developed countries was 4.4 billion U.S. dollars. So we see basically a tenfold increase over a four-year period. This is a source of soft power for China. Its ability to influence world affairs not through military, but in this case, through cash. China also has a major energy security problem in the sense that it relies on the imports of energy sources from around the world. And you can imagine one of its key targets is Canada. In order to fill China's energy security needs, China is increasingly investing in Canada and in particular, investing in our natural resources, and even more specifically, investing in our energy stocks. So just to give you some sense as to the extent to which China is now investing in Canada, at the end of 2008, Chinese investments in Canada equaled 2.7 billion, billion U.S. dollars. In 2009, Chinese investments from just two firms into Canadian energy equal 10 billion U.S. dollars. Now, again, you can say, well, you know, we're not particularly happy about that here in Canada, and we're not particularly beholden to the Chinese for this, 
But haven't we heard more about Chinese investments in Canada over the last five, ten years than we've ever heard before? I mean, the fact of the matter is, is that through these investments, China is buying a stake in Canada. And in many ways, buying a stake in our, how our governments behave and the relationships between our two countries. Soft power is also about emulation. Soft power is not just economic power. It's not just power through investment dollars. But soft power is also about emulation. It's about people wanting to be like you. And one of the emerging themes in international relations is this idea of the Beijing Consensus which of course is the riff on the Washington Consensus, which is the American model of liberalism, democracy, and capitalism. But what we're increasingly seeing is this thing called the Beijing Consensus. That what Beijing, or China more generally, has to offer is an alternative model of development. That you don't have to just listen to the United States, you don't have to just listen to what the Washington insiders have to say about what your country needs to do. China presents an alternative model. And a model that, frankly, more and more people around the world want to emulate. As part of this Beijing consensus, we also see increasingly cultural power. We increasingly see, for instance, Chinese culture now being part of Western mainstream culture. We see the proliferation of what are called Confucius Institutes all around the world where the Chinese government is funding the establishment of Confucius Institutes to create language, Chinese language training centers around the world. For people to learn Chinese who otherwise would not have had the opportunity to learn Chinese. My six-year-old son takes Chinese lessons on Saturday mornings at the JCC on Spadina, actually. And the place is now full. There are literally hundreds of students or ethnically Chinese, or mixed like my son, or not, learning Chinese. So China now has this fantastic reservoir of cultural power. People want to learn Chinese. People want to eat Chinese food. They want to learn Chinese language, literature. They want to watch Chinese films, and so on. The argument is that the United States used to have lots of soft power. Everybody wanted to be American. Everybody wanted to drink Coca-Cola and smoke Marlboro cigarettes. <laughs> and drink Budweiser. But over the last few decades, American soft power is believed to be in decline. Meanwhile, Chinese soft power is on the rise. Well, we also know that. So we know that China is an economic power. We know China is a military power. We know China has grown its stock of soft power. We also know that at least there is a perception that America is in decline. America's military power, as we have seen just as a result of the election south of the border, America's military power is increasingly spread thin. America's economic power is in decline. You know, in China right now, they're posting economic growth forecasts of about 6 to 7%, which is considered a slowdown. Meanwhile, in the United States, they would love to have 1 to 2% growth. So America's economic power is in decline, particularly since the, end of the, uh, since the financial crisis. And in many ways, it's soft power is in decline. The idea of democracy is increasingly tarnished. The end of history thesis is increasingly seen as arrogant. And democracy, and all you have to do is look south of the border to Washington, is being equated with legislative deadlock and inefficiency. So if you look here, the first quote, CSIS, the Center for Strategic and International Studies in, in Washington, says China's mix of economic engagement and soft power has spurred some fears that Western influence, that is say American influence, in developing regions will thereby diminish. Many Americans in particular are concerned about losing strategic influence in Asia. In the past, the United States used to be the unequivocal 
dominant power in Asia. It had enormous soft power in Asia. All the countries in Asia wanted to be just like America. It had tremendous military power in Asia. It has maintained a tremendous military presence in the region, be it Korea, Japan, the Seventh Fleet. And arguably, most importantly, the American economy effectively bankrolled the rise of East Asia's economic development. All those things that Samsung made, or Nintendo made, or Acer made, or Asus, Americans bought those products. American consumers effectively bankrolled and underwrote the economic development of East Asia. All of these sources of power, however, as Cesar's would put it, is in decline. American soft power, American military power, and its economic power are all in decline, and all in decline concomitant with the rise of China. Which takes us to the second point. George Soros says, there's really a remarkable rapid shift of power and influence from the U.S. to China. Right? This isn't just simply the decline of the U.S. in a vacuum, but rather it's the decline of the U.S. and the decline of its influence to China. Today, China has not only a more vigorous economy, I can't believe Soros says this, but actually a better functioning government in the U.S. Now, if you think about this in 2010, you can understand exactly what Soros is talking about. He looks at the U.S. Congress, he sees deadlock, he looks at a president that's unable to get legislation through, he looks at China that seems to be able to work and function much more efficiently. The key point I want to make here in terms of what we know, therefore, then, is China's rise and the lecture of, the title of today's lecture, The Rise of Great Powers, China's rise is amidst America's decline. And the fact that China is rising as America is perceived to be declining has what we call in international relations systemic implications. And indeed, there is the presumption that as China continues to rise and America continues to decline, we may see the potential transformation of the entire international system. That the international system that we have come to know in the post-war era may soon be coming to an end. Just last week I was in Washington, D.C. I was invited down to give a talk, although I wasn't told what I was supposed to talk about until I got there, after lunch, uh, right before my supposed talk. What they wanted to know was, is this rise of China a serious threat? As we look at our own elections, and as we look at what they view to be a broken American system, should we be taking very seriously China's rise? And should we expect China's rise, as being in Washington, D.C., to have systemic implications on the international system? And basically, the only resolution we could have from out of that conversation was that we don't know. We don't know a lot of things. Now, before we go on, I want to do a few clipper questions here. I want to get your opinion on this rising great power. So the first question is, and it's A if you agree, B if you disagree. The growing importance of China as an economic power is more of an opportunity than a threat. If you agree, 